I'll preface the discussion we're about to have with the fact that I am a Marxist, um, so I'm not <laughs> not the biggest fan of capitalism. Um, but there's a very striking sort of empirical claim that seems to be made here, which is that supply and demand is not relevant within animal agriculture. Um, could you elaborate on why you think that is? Because governments are bail out big agriculture. They are f they are backed by big agriculture. This is just this is known. The lobbyists are the ones that support um, the big agriculture, and they are propped up, and they will be bailed out every time, even if the money isn't going down. And in the UK, they get subsidies, so they are propped up. There is no way that big agriculture will fail unless law is changed. Well, that's a, that's a very different kind of statement. That's a statement about like the monetary policy and about the protectionist policy of the government in question. Um, I'm under the impression that there are a variety of kinds of subsidies. Uh, what are the sub subsidies you think that are the most problematic and what percentage of the agricultural GDP do you think that they represent? Well, the majority subsidies, this is going from um, the UK, the majority of subsidies goes to animal farmers for dairy and for... That's, for that's not the question that I... Flesh. That's not the kind of question I asked. Uh, I'll, I'll clarify a bit more. So um, I'm, I'm much more specialized in Canadian agricultural subsidies. Um, I've taken a lot of time to review a rather, relatively lengthy document that was prepared for the U.S. government on the basis that the Canadian government was engaging in forms of price manipulation um, with dairy farmers in Canada. And what I'm more so getting at is that within Canada, there are distinct kinds of subsidies. One of the subsidies that is most frequently chosen by governments is a form of subsidy that actually is only meant to target the risk of an investment. So what happens is the subsidy doesn't actually occur on the basis of sale or on the basis of production. It only occurs under unforeseen risk circumstances. Um, and so because of that, it doesn't actually seem to have <clears throat> that big of an effect on the economy. Um, so we'd have to actually clarify what kinds of subsidies we're talking about. And then the other problem is that what you would have to do is show to what degree the subsidies are actually a part of the GDP. So we can't just say that the subsidies are the entirety of the marketplace. That seems fairly incorrect because if that were the case, it actually wouldn't cost anything Whoa. to go purchase meat, right? If it was just Whoa. a 100% subsidy. Well, why do you think the healthy foods sort of say you you at least in the UK, this is just UK. I know I don't really know much about Canada, but um, at least why are blueberries and strawberries and grapes more expensive than, say, unhealthy foods such as meat or dairy or whatever? Well, I actually don't know that that is the case. I think that that's a very relatively complex question. One one thing is that yeah, they are they are subsidized to an extent. Um, but you're comparing sort of a luxury product with a very high price elasticity with a staple product that has a very low price elasticity. So there's already a, a very basic sort of very fundamental differences between those two products um, that would actually explain the price difference. The... Yeah, but say potato crisps, as we would call them in the UK, or chips or whatever, you could get a pack of those for 50p. Yeah, I and mean, then say, but what I are to go get some? But do, so, so when you bring up when you bring up those as like sort of comparatively, um, do you have some kind of input output analysis or some kind of life cycle analysis that would show that I there mean, going is like really techy techy? Well, well, no, I'm saying. going, I'm going to, I'm doing, I'm doing a, I'm doing a pretty standard supply chain analysis because I sort of claim <laughs> that something doesn't have any sort of. Um, well, the, the, the supply and demand don't have any sort of effect on things is a very, very like lofty claim, right? Uh, I kind of, as much as it's a bit of a meme, I, I kind of hold to Hitchens' razor. And when a very extreme claim 
that seems to be very much against our most basic intuitions is made. I uh, do, re- I, do requi- I do, I do require, I do require evidence for that. And, and that the sort of evidence that you have presented, because I'll, I'll just grant that what you're talking about is true. There are actually just easier explanations that do actually sort of ease out what the differences are there and also call into question that you sort of know what you're talking about. So we've seen the rise, at least in the UK, of plant-based vegan products. Why haven't we seen the full or decline of animals being slaughtered? Yeah, so there's, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of which is that it's actually that total consumption of goods is going up or that it might not be the case that plant-based proteins are an analogous product to uh, animal-based proteins in the consumer market. The other thing is that there might be levels of overproduction that are currently occurring, uh, and that there might be now be levels of wastage that is occurring. Um, and the other thing is that it might just sort of be very overestimated um, how much the plant base has grown. Um, and so what you would have to do is you would actually have to do a much more rigorous multivariate analysis looking at whether or not these are analogous products, what the elasticity on these things are, um, whether or not there actually has been any amount of per capita adjusted change in these products. And to be frank, I haven't actually seen anyone do that. Um, These are like questions that are brought up, but when people are sort of pressed on the claim that there is no supply and demand effects on meat, and I ask these sort of very basic questions that would be able to tease out whether there isn't or isn't a relationship, uh, it seems like you're sort of missing on the empirics. So I'll just, I'll just sort of like ask you pretty bluntly, do you have those kinds of empirics? Could you tease out um, the, the actual causal like relationship here uh, at all? The thing is, is, you're just using like very big like political jargon and like, I'm not a specialist in this subject. Like, oh well, do you have a do you have like animal a animal rights activist? Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, I can try and make it simpler. Um, do you have any kind of like paper or any kind of analysis by an expert that helped you get to this conclusion, or is this just sort of a thing that you think? I can pull. I can get some stuff up if you give me a sec. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to see it. Um, do you happen to be familiar with an Instagram user called Vegan Batgirl? No, unfortunately not. I don't spend a terrible amount of time on Instagram, Brand, unfortunately. Brand, we, we, we are familiar with her. We've reached out to her and raised a critique of her views. And she Oh, did he, come... say ba- did he yeah, say she, Batgirl? She, 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 um, we're, we're, we're very suspicious of her. We asked her to come in here and do a session with the oh, yeah, uh, no, hardcore yeah, stats, right. stats and politics guys, and she... Uh, she would not come in. So Sorry, we're, I, we're very skeptical of her. It's the vegan I, I thought that she was a YouTuber, and I heard vegan backhoe, and I was just very confused, <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah, we've, we've heard the talk from Vegan Batgirl, um, and this is actually what prompted me to look into the Canadian subsidy literature, as well as um, some more in-depth analysis. There's one really interesting paper by... A researcher named Whitehead out of a Hurtwich University that does attempt to do some of the very basic life cycle analysis on this stuff that comes to a distinct conclusion from, from Batgirl. Now, if you have like hard numbers um, on this stuff or a rigorous like life cycle analysis, I'm very willing to be convinced. The problem is, is that not only are there very simple empirical problems with what you're saying, I actually think, also think there's a further fundamental conceptual problem, which is just that it isn't actually the case that a subsidy would imply that supply and demand do not have a place in that market. You're just actually using a form of single payer or multi-payer for the demand side. Um, that can have benefits for getting a certain price point, 
but it doesn't actually mean that supply and demand plays no part. Um, one sort of counter example to your view would be in Canada right now, um, one really big issue with our cancer treatments is that there are very novel cancer treatments that have a very low supply because what it, the reagents that are required uh, for the tests and um, some of the chemicals that are required for the production of the treatment are in very low supply and have to be engineered. And so even though that treatment is heavily subsidized to the consumer, um, the government itself is still paying a very hefty fee due to the, the lack of a, a demand and a very hot supply for effective cancer treatments. So all that you really do when you have subsidization is you have a level of abstraction between the consumer demand and an actual aggregate demand in the cycle of production. Let me put something to you. Um, say, for example, um, this is this is going into this is supply and demand again. Um, so, you have um, a person. Um, they eat um, uh, real meat products produced by Richmond, which is a brand in the UK. Um, and then for, for cert, this is more of a thought experiment, but hear me out. Um, and then for lunch. They go to um, Greg's, which is a fast food chain. They get a donut for, for lunch. They get a, a meat sausage roll and a meat pasty. And then for dinner, every day, um, they go to Wagamama's and they do, like, food, like, different food. Um, and so, okay, so they do they sell meat, obviously. And, okay, so say um, this person, okay, finds out about veganism, decides, right, I'm going to go vegan, um, so then that person buys the meat-free vegan Richmond sausages, has that for breakfast every day now, um, and then at lunchtime goes to Greg's, has the vegan sausage roll, pasty, and the new vegan donut. And then for dinner, they go to, um, they go to, um, Wagamama's and they have the new vegan steak thing that they've just put out. So where is the supply and demand? Where is that changing? You see what I mean? Um, no, I act, I, so a few things is that I think that getting to these hypotheticals is actually just sort of getting away from the issue more than yeah, it actually you're is vegan point, pinpointing the issue. And you're buying these products, you're still supporting the same companies. There's issues with that. So, for example, if I go to McDonald's right now, and I buy water, and my neighbor goes to McDonald's and buys water, and in fact, every single person in the world goes to McDonald's and buys water, even though in this production cycle, they also had uh, on offer the McChicken, the McRib, etc. there would be zero granulated demand for non-water products. And so there's actually a really good chance that in the next production cycle, McDonald's actually turns all of their profits into investment into water, or at least shifts a significant portion of the next production cycle into water. Um, there's actually a very healthy amount of literature and research on uh, granulization of, of consumer habits and consumer choice. Um, Target is like a master case in this. Like, if, if what you're saying was sort of true, companies like Amazon and Walmart and Target would be incomprehensible because it's not even clear that those sell a specific kind of product. They sell very granularized targeted products that are most likely to sell to the varying kinds of consumers that might exist in a very complex economy. Um, and the same is sort of true of Greg's, which is that they're making a calculated uh, <laughs> like uh, risk on whether or not there will be a sufficient amount of vegans who desire to buy the vegan sausage roll versus the non-vegans who will be buying the non-vegan products. Do you think and that, and that this changes every production buy cycle. these products? Sorry. No, no, no. And that's, that's, that, I mean, that's, that, I don't think that that really changes my view. My point is just that um, companies, even though, yes, there, there is to some degree in, in some, in some degree, we are indeed like subsidizing some amount of non-vegan production that is more due to the artifacting of 
a production cycle more so than it is due to like some kind of like market force. If the market were and the production cycle were perfectly efficient, it would have the ability to predict and shift due to consumer habits and consumer trends. Uh, unfortunately, it, it doesn't, and that's why we have certain levels of wastage in our production cycle. Um, the I don't really know that what you're getting at is is what you're hoping to get at. Um, well, it, it, like, 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 I think you really have to understand that if supply and demand worked at the brand level, like you're sort of seeming to suggest it does, um, or if that, like, <laughs> by sort of implication of purchasing products that have in some part of the supply chain some levels of uh, non-vegan production, that would be a very pro big problem for not just vegans, but for the economy as a whole, because complex supply chains like Walmart would not make any money. They would be unable to make any sort of assessments of what they should sell. And so I think that the very existence of things like Walmart and Amazon and shifts in consumer habits and the development of like rapid prototyping clothing trends like Zara are a pretty decent showcase against sort of the thing that it seems like you and Vegan Batgirl might be suggesting here. I'm not saying that supply and demand doesn't exist at all. I'm saying in re in result in like correlation to um Oh, Sorry, Tim. oh no, you don't. No fucking yeah, way, no, I, Ollie. Your yeah, claim, I'll, I'll go ahead. Your, I'll go ahead, but I have, to, I have the same point. Supply and demand is a myth. That is a yeah, yeah. It was, it, it was. I got, I got, I got called. I got called in here because I. No, no. I was, I was, I was freaking out in chat because you were making a very harsh claim. I mean. I'm, Isaac, are you recording? I mean, we could <laughs> we could probably just listen. To well, it. then you misunderstood, yeah, I, or I, I said I said it wrong. Sure, I mean, well, well, what if like if what? So what will what I'm fine to do is if you want to say it very clearly that you don't think that supply and demand are a myth, and then you want to formulate no, no, no. a new position, that that's fine. I don't, and you you can My even position... you can even you can even say that that wasn't your claim, but you need to make it abundantly clear, like before we move forward. Okay, cool. My position is, and I apologize if it, if it doesn't come across clearly, my position is, is supply and demand doesn't affect animal agriculture. It's a myth. Yeah, that, that's, that a, that's, that's, an, that's, an, that's an insane view, and I've been pushing against that this entire time. I, I, you, haven't, well, you have not substantiated that. Well, because A, you have a fundamental misunderstanding of how subsidies affect the supply curve. B, you haven't proven that subsidies actually are a significant portion of the animal agriculture uh, GDP. You have not proven that there is some kind of causal relationship there that I should be concerned about. And when we started to talk about product granularity, you seem to be very, very confused about how companies make decisions in the modern era. Well, so, much the, so much of the so much world. Well, because they're the only three percent of the population is vegan, and and even within that three percent, many vegan identifiers are not even really vegans they're people who eat a plant-based diet or a vegan diet but also like will snack on candy bars or eat fish socially sure but um, well, well, well no i mean that's not that's not that's not that's not just a sure that's a really big issue for your view right is there is a very small percentage of the population is vegan or vegetarian and that does help to explain why we haven't really been able to see much of a shift in vegan production and much of a downward shift in non-vegan production. I mean, even these sort of myths about dairy farms going broke due to, um, due to veganism are actually engaging in a lot of framing problems. If you look at uh, trends going back to the 60s or 50s, dairy has been in decline for a very long time um, and is not actually in any way significantly correlated with veganism. It has much more to do with the fact that um, there's an oversaturation of milk producers on the marketplace, so much to the point that regardless of veganism, there is a lot of wastage. It has much more to do with the fact that uh, due to the relative success of targeted advertising or targeted campaigns against the consumption of fats, milk has seen a relative decline since the 50s and 60s, um, et cetera. So, I mean... 
these sort of like very lofty claims that people are making about veganism, I'm just going to return to Hitchens Razor. Like you're making very extreme claims and you well, don't I'm really seem to have the evidence. With you. I'm in agreement about the dairy production thing. I think that's a lie. I don't agree that that um, veganism is affecting dairy, the dairy industry at all. Cool. Okay, man. As long as we agree on one thing, that's a good start. But <laughs> I really want to underscore that the sort of other claim that supply and demand is not relevant in the context of animal agriculture is a very lofty claim that requires very lofty evidence. Well, animal agriculture is that is bailed out by the government. So I'm, is... I'm not doubting that. I, I agreed that the very usual kind of subsidy that occurs is a form of lottery subsidy wherein a certain amount of individuals within the marketplace can apply for subsidies con- uh, considering that they have unforeseen um, shortages or unforeseen sales. That's true. The question then is, what percentage of the overall GDP of that sector does that represent? And if we did a multi-generational life cycle analysis, would we be able to pick that out as something that has causal efficacy on things like consumer habits or production levels or whatever? Um, It also just sort of fundamentally misunderstands how subsidies affect supply curves. Because again, subsidies aren't necessarily just a head-on change to the amount of supply. They, all that subsidies really are, via like the way that like governments work, is a form of collective bargaining and via like a multi-payer or a single-payer system for the purchasing of animal products. So it is actually just an increase in the demand still. It's just aggrandizing that, right? Like you just have an aggregate of that versus some kind of individualized consumer behavior um which is kind of the point of a government is to aggregate consumer decisions and to use that collective bargaining power to get better prices and better supply stability but that doesn't mean that if there was no demand for it that there would be uh, still a hundred percent supply if that were the case the government would be engaging in a subsidy year over year that would be completely pointless. Um, um, are you it, familiar with the... Oh, sorry, hold on. I mean, the, the other thing is, is that... the BPS. Like, like, like what, what, what you would have to demonstrate to me, right, is something like that the subsidies and the supply remain constant year over year, or that the demand... Or the, that the supply is only correlated to the levels of subsidy. So, like, these are... Again, these are empirical questions and when i asked you for data you cited an instagram account so are you um familiar with the basic payment uh, sorry the basement the basic scheme basic payment scheme i should say uh, that in the uk no again i'm i'm not an expert in uk subsidies i'm, uh, I'm much much more familiar with canadian subsidies again so, like if, so, so, so similar. Like, it might be i mean Again, I mean. So the reason why they can apply for it is if they've got a certain amount of land. So it's an environmental sort of um, uh, what sort of incentive, and that's the reason why they would get that money. Sure. I don't. But, I don't really see how. So that therefore, defeats they're them. getting. So therefore, they're getting that extra money, and they're not. So they could still be doing the same activities they could still be farming animals they still could be exploiting animals they could have a dairy farm but as long as they've got that environmental thing that environmental incentive there they're still getting the money even if the price of their um milk is going down yeah so what getting that money but but what what percentage of the sector gdp does that represent um i'm not totally sure I mean, that, that seems like a pretty fundamental question to your view. Like, I, like it sounds almost like... I think it's like ve- 5%. If you've got three crops or something, then it's sure. like... Sure. I mean, that's, that's sort of a... 
I mean, that's sort of a very weird thing to say, right? I mean, if we're talking about like a 5% subsidy, I mean, like margins of profitability on these things are generally speaking, like who knows what, right? It could be significantly lower, significantly higher than 5%. You'd have to show that the supply is strongly related to the existence of the subsidy. Okay, how about I do some more research into the yeah, specific I mean, subsidies? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, one thing that I think that Ask Yourself would agree to as well is that it's not like we're making some hard necessary claim. It's not like we're saying like it's necessarily or like logically entailed that supply and demand are related here. It's just that supply and demand, as far as we are concerned, applies in all other sectors except for very extreme cases, such as like fire services, where there isn't really even any commoditization. Um, and so in virtue of that, we're sort of just taking the agnostic position and to have this sort of very negative claim requires a very strong kind of evidence in the negative. Um, if what you're happy to do is just say, look, I don't have the data here, I can come back. I'm, I'm happy to talk about this at a later date, but yeah, until then, sure. until then, I think until then, I think what you should do is just sort of back away from the claim. I think there's much stronger, there's much stronger arguments for leftism um, and even anarchism than supply and demand is inefficacious because of governments in animal agriculture. Like I think that there's much better arguments than that. I mean, because, sure, be, but... because like because look, I'm. Look, I, I'm, I'm approaching this conversation as a Marxist and as a vegan, and I disagree with everything you're saying. I don't, I don't have motivations here. My, my motivation would actually be to agree with you. And everything you're sort of saying is kind of very confused. I mean, I'm still, I'm not, obviously not as educated in this completely as, as it seems that you've delved really deeply into this one um subject um i'm just picking out piece i'm picking out pieces and trying to make sense of things and trying to well yeah that's the best, i suppose yeah, yeah that's fair i mean no no one's blaming you for wanting to do the best right it's just sort of um it's sort of like as a like side point um we i think that we owe it to the animals to not be using arguments that we don't actually have certainty about. We owe it to the animals to be giving good, solid arguments that can't have holes poked in them easily because it makes us look like idiots. If you want, to be honest, it, if you want, if you argument like like for animal rights is that individuals they have their own experience. That's it. That's that's it. Well, for me. I, I mean, I think that a lot of philosophers would have a lot of fun with that. Um, I, I think that that's a that, that has its own problems. The the thing though is just again like I think that moving forward, one of the things that I like to always question myself on is whether or not I actually do hold this view because of the evidence, or whether or not I hold it because of motivations. And it sounds like you sort of admitted to being motivated on this view rather than actually holding it because you've been shown that it's the view. Um, when we when we want to do our best towards the animals, I think that we should be giving the best arguments that have the best evidence that if you slap them on a carnist or slap them uh, on a capitalist or whatever, they don't possibly have a way of refuting it. And it was very trivial to sort of ask questions about what you were saying that left you to the point where you didn't really seem to know whether or not what you were saying was accurate. And that's sort of a big issue. Um, and I think that the animals deserve better than that. Well, at least from what I've looked into, that's what makes sense more to me anyway. Right, but if you're being honest with me, have you looked into this more than listening to Vegan Batgirl? I mean, podcasts and listening to different things and different people has led me to this, and it's just what makes sense to me. Uh... I mean, okay, I, I haven't looked I, I don't, into I, I, the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that I think that's important, or or at least that um, the people who are saying it are are individuals who 
very are very likely to have presented the data. Um, one sort of big problem we have with vegan Batgirl is that she's not appealing to any literature um, and that she hasn't published any literature. So it hasn't been peer reviewed. It hasn't been looked over by economists. Um, there seems to be some very fundamental problems with her assumptions and her understanding of subsidies. And so we're, we're sort of confused. The same thing is sort of here where if you're telling me that where you're getting this from is an Instagram account and some podcasts, um, I mean, Joe Rogan has a podcast and there's a lot of things on that podcast that I think are relatively controversial. I mean, if our baseline for proof was someone said it on a podcast, we couldn't really blame that many people for eating a carnivore diet since Joe Rogan, who has, I think probably the most popular podcast in the world has had multiple carnivore dieters on there multiple times. It's not a very strong form of evidence. I would recommend that if we're going to be making these very extreme claims in the future, where there's a lot at stake, uh, we really do owe it to ourselves and to the other stakeholders in the situation to make sure that we're arguing with the best evidence. Yeah, I need to find the data. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a good idea. And I mean, look, if you come up with the data, that would be really interesting and you should present it um, because I think that that would be really cool to, to see. Like, it's not that I'm motivated against this position. It's just that it's a really extreme claim and you haven't really presented really extreme data yet. Okay, I, I accept that. I'm going to, I'm gonna as soon as I go to sleep, uh, sorry, as soon as I wake up the next day, I'm going to, um, yeah, I'm going to research that as hard as I can. Sure. Um, it was nice talking to you. I'll tap out and maybe if Isaac is here, he has a few more things to say just before you dip. But yeah, it was nice chatting to you and hopefully you can get back to us. Um, I'm happy to, to look over data with you. And again, I've only really looked at the Canadian stuff, so maybe the UK stuff is a bit different. But uh, yeah, it was nice chatting to you and hopefully you can find something. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed this conversation. <laughs>